Good afternoon. We are pleased to welcome you to the Washington Laboratories Academy webinar series. We hope you find the next hour or so useful and informative. We recognize that engineering challenges can be complex and we're always looking for ways to support the technology industry. Before we begin, a few housekeeping details. First, I hope everyone can see the title slide on their computer. A recording of this presentation will be sent to all attendees. A full screen view may be preferred. Your selection at your computer can be done by using the menu panel. In the menu on your screen, go to view and then select full screen. We estimate that the main bulk of the presentation would take approximately 45 minutes. We welcome your questions. You can submit them to us via email at questions at WLL.com. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Elizabeth Perrier is the CEO of Orbit Compliance with more than 20 years of experience in the industry. She has a master's in telecommunication management and a PMP from St. Jose State University in California. She is very active in the compliance community, contributing with technical articles to industry publications and speaking appearances in many venues, including FCC workshops in the U.S. Orbit's expertise is in Latin America, serving manufacturers around the world with regulatory matters and helping certify products for the telecom, safety, energy efficiency, medical, battery, and environmental fields. Elizabeth Perrier was born and raised in Latin America. Her deep understanding of Latin culture in each country's law has made her a key partner to many manufacturers who seek Orbix guidance. So without further ado, let's explore compliance south of the border with Elizabeth Perrier presenting to us part one, Mexico, Central America, and Caribbean. Elizabeth, are you there? A kind introduction uh, and uh, allow me to share my screen. Two seconds over here. Please let me know if you can see it. Can you hear me? Yes, everything is fine. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction, and it is a pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar series that uh, Washington Lab puts together. It's truly an honor and uh, greatly uh, appreciated that uh, we are part of this uh, wonderful morning this morning. Um, so our goal uh, is to be able to share our regulatory knowledge on Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean with your audience. Uh, we're delighted to uh, um, find out what their needs are in the Q&I period, Q&A period. So uh, we will uh, start uh, with uh, uh, presenting Mexico and then going to the other countries. Uh, we will first follow with Central America and we'll finish up with the Caribbean. Uh, we have a lot of slides to go over, so we would like uh, if you can um, have any questions that you have to save them for the end so you, we can cover all the information that we have for you today. Okay? So let's start with Mexico, uh, the second largest country in Latin America with uh, a lot of interest from many manufacturers to sell a uh, product in Mexico. Uh, this past year, we've had... Uh, indications that there were a lot of the regulations were going to change and sure enough we had a lot of uh, uh, a lot of new changes uh, not only in the telecom area but also in the safety area um, importation rules uh, had uh, changed and impacted many manufacturers so we we're going to be touching on on that uh, first of all so let's talk about the the main regulatory bodies that we have in Mexico We'll start with IFETE, which mainly is the regulatory body that um, oversees telecommunications equipment. 
And also, we're going to talk about the NISE, which is another national organization that actually developed some of the standards uh, for the safety uh, products in uh, Mexico. Um, I talked about the changes, um, so we'll talk about that because that has kind of changed the way that um, products has been certified in the past years. On June 3rd, we had uh, an announcement which uh, pretty much changed the way that we do things in uh, Mexico in terms of certifying product. Just to start with, we can talk about uh, the type of certification that we we have to go through on safety in Mexico. We're always looking at the product, so it's product certification. Labeling requirements is mandatory, so the NOM marking, very important. Uh, the validity of the certificate, usually on the, cert on the safety certification, is a year. And in-country testing is a must. Uh, now we have other options that we're going to be talking about a little later on in terms of uh, what our options have opened up with the new changes. And uh, the lead time is usually four weeks. It has been a little bit um, um, very some in this past month because of the changes that we have had, but usually the lead time should be four weeks. Our company are, is still delivering four weeks. I know there's been delays on other and other agencies. Okay, so before uh, we continue, let's talk about some of the specifics about a safety certificate in Mexico. So all products that are meant to public consumption, they are need a mandatory requirement of a safety certificate, so a NOM certificate. Industrial products in the past were exempt, uh, but now with the changes that I just mentioned uh, that took place on June 3rd, uh, now, many of the industrial products, if they do have some component that has a NOM applicability, in this case, for example, a power supply, they lose that exemption. So that came out of um, uh, surprise to many manufacturers and we had a lot of uh, product retained uh, on customs during that transition period in June and July of this year. So hopefully by now, um, a lot of you are, are uh, aware of what the requirements are, and if you're not, we'll be very happy to uh, answer the questions at the end of the session and clarify any any um, queries that you may have. Um, one of the key items here uh, that change and uh, was applicable is the HS code. So certificates before they were issued to the make and model, obviously the local holder, they didn't have to have the HS code printed on the certificate. So this was the biggest change that came on June 3rd that all certificates now coming in had to show the HS code uh, for importation. So a uh, huge change, a lot of reprinting of old certificates have to go through. I, I believe some of the certifying bodies are not finished on uh, printing those certificates yet, and uh, the reason why was the delays. Um, another big change to, to uh, highlight here is that safety certificates in the past, you could have a local holder, and that local holder not necessarily had to be the person claiming the product in country. Now the requirement is that anyone that is going to import product in the country must have a certificate under the name of the importer. So you cannot have a third party that's not related to the importation of the, of the product. So that is a very key factor because uh, it just um, extends the process where you, if you have a certificate, then you have to have certificate extensions for some of you distributors. So this is something that also we can talk about in the Q&A. Um, in terms of other changes, um, it, um, pretty much uh, the highly specialized products uh, um, option that we have that hasn't changed, the dictamen the process hasn't changed. Uh, uh, mandatory of commercial products, as I mentioned, hasn't changed. Uh, the family uh, product um, uh, ability that we would have with a, a safety certificate has not changed, still up to 10 uh, products. So uh, good news on that sense. Documents required uh, pretty much have stayed the same, just with the mandatory uh, um, rule that we need to have the HS code now. We always ourselves always ask for the HS code for verification, but now uh, for sure this is something that is mandatory. 
In terms of uh, the certificate itself, uh, again, one year validity, family certificate, and it must be issued to the distributor for product. Labeling, as you know, uh, the GNOME uh, certification, uh, very, very important. And PMX is related to the process that uh, um, it has to go through to get uh, to get a GNOME certification. Just uh, there was an update uh, in published in 2017 and in 2018, it was, it was actually uh, done uh, um, uh, public and the change was made. One of the many questions that are, are being asked is the NOM01. NOM01 had been in uh, um, discussion since 2017, and um, the regulatory body and the ministry took a long time to make the implementation uh, obviously um, viable. It just got published uh, about a month ago. Um, so we have a new GNOME 001. Uh, the big changes are that uh, we have a completely um, more robust, updated list of products that are being certified. Um, so this is just a portion. There's like two or three pages long of the, of the uh, different uh, products that are being included. Uh, one of the big changes, I think, is uh, the fact that now there are a specific um, testing requirements for certain um, products. For example, uh, audio and video equipment systems are going to have a new uh, PEC that we call it, which is a new testing method. So entertainment machines are going to have the same microwaves, uh, electronic um, power systems, external power supplies, electronic toys. So all of those have special uh, testing requirements which before they were all uh, grouped in one uh, group. Uh, this doesn't mean you're going to have a second certificate. It just means it's going to have to go through a different testing requirement, but more likely more uh, directed to that product and um, more likely a little bit more expensive as well. Um, along with the new uh, norm, we have uh, new schemes that are uh, options. So the process where we initially certified the product has not changed. So we still present a sample. We still go through the encounter process and we get a certificate. Uh, here, I think the options is on how you're going to be certifying your product. Uh, the one that we are used to is the M1 scheme where we tested the product. We had a follow-up visit, you know, right about the six, six months and a half. Uh, we are already looking at, at uh, the renewal and a couple of months in, we're already in the process and making sure that you know that product gets re uh, renewed, so you keep your original certification. So that in itself, it's still um, you know valid. It's still a process that we can go through. Uh, the second possibility now there is um, the different scheme that you you go to the testing process as well as with the maintenance process, but now there is an an, a, an option to actually have traceability to your product. Some manufacturers may want to track where that product has gone uh, has gone internally, whether when it was imported, uh, tracking it in the serial number. So there's that ability that you can actually do that and um, uh, request that type of certification. Uh, there's another scheme that is also being introduced and uh, is um, uh, have the ability to actually have the factory uh, certified. Um, the certifying body would go to the factory and uh, actually go through the entire audit, uh, make sure that uh, the factory itself, through the certification process, is, is um, a, a part of their process. They have the norm uh, requirements uh, actually as part of what they are considering of green certification if the certifying body in Mexico approves that they are in line of, of their expectations, then there is no testing required for 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 the fa the factory and the certification process is much 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 easier. So you will be skipping the the testing uh, process with the ISO scheme. The lot scheme, as, as it name it, uh, the name it implies, uh, product would come uh, into the country. There will be a, a sample collected. It would be um, 
tested locally at every shipment that would come in, there will be the same process. It would have to go through the certification process by collecting the, the units from when it arrives in country. So this is what um, uh, has changed a little bit, um, a little bit more options than before, and uh, you know, hopefully suiting um, different manufacturers' needs. NOM 019 is the other one that has been uh, talked about being changed for a long, long time as well. Uh, I believe this year is going to get uh, published as well as it was NOM 001. Uh, here, the big uh, difference is that NOM 016 and NOM 019, now they are being pulled together, so uh, creating a, a new uh, NOM 019, which is called IT Equipment and Peripherals. Again, a huge number of new products, including all that. And uh, the implementation, I forgot, I'm so sorry, NOM 01, the implementation is going to be in May 2020. Uh, this one, uh, NOM 019, it gets published at the end of uh, this year, which we suspect it will be. More likely, we're looking at implementation sometime in June, July. Okay. Um, what would be the impact on uh, the implementation NOM 019? Uh, obviously, anybody that has the product already tested, already um, uh, compliant for a year, those are not affected, but, but any other product that is going to be falling within the implementation period, you're going to have to be tested to the new requirements and also have the option of the scheme process that I just uh, I talked about a little bit. So with that, that safety portion of how Mexico has changed uh, is completed, and we can go through the IFET process, which is the telecom area. Um, here, uh, just as a summary, uh, IFET uh, through the APEC or NOM 208 process, uh, you're able to do a modular or product certification. Um, Marking is not required, but the homologation number is required in order to commercialize your product. A one year validity for the first time that you are uh, processing your approval, and then the second year you can actually apply to be for a permanent um, um, approval. Uh, test reports are from the FCC and CE are um, acceptable for some bands. Anything that goes through the Pareto process, we can use the test reports from from uh, for that for the bands that are outside the NOM 208, FCC certification verification uh, happens every time. If you are asking to have the test reports uh, used, obviously they're always going to verify that they are, um, you know, in line of what was reported in other countries. And our lead times usually between seven to eight weeks. Uh, in terms of choosing certifying bodies here. Uh, there's many certifying bodies in Mexico. Uh, one that is very known is NICE, uh, who does a lot of safety and wireless uh, uh, as a certifying body. ANSE and MPMX are other certifying bodies that are, are uh, Mexico-based. Uh, we talked about IFETE already. IFETE is the telecommunications agency uh, that uh, is accredited as lab to perform testing. Uh, lo local uh, representation is required. A big thing at this point, no uh, factory inspection is required. Um, the option of NISA on the safety sounds like you know this is uh, something that is being changed if we're going to um, opt for the option of the ISO. In terms of certificates, uh, there's two types um, uh, that are uh, important and also the second one, which is secondary extension. So temporary is when you do the first certification process. Permanent, the second, the, after the first year, then the, the, you have the ability to have that uh, permanent certification. Um, in if it, we don't call it uh, families, but instead of calling it families, we, we look uh, we call them extensions. So an extension to a product or that will kind of become the, the family, but it, instead of calling a family, it's called an extension. So this is uh, done for similar products to be added to a certificate. Here, just uh, a. Um, sample of what uh, NOM 208. Um, um, has as a in terms of technology, it, it regulates Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, analog E1 devices. Um, usually for in-country testing, we need one sample, and uh, this certificate is needed uh, in to, in order to import product. 
In terms of the IFET certificate, the IFET certificate is a certificate that allows you to actually to commercialize the product in country. Uh, again, as I mentioned, family extensions are available to be able to have the family products. It's uh, renewed the first year, and the second year is renewed for for for, for a permanent certification. Okay, so here just to give you a little bit more idea, NOM 208 uh, regulates bands 902 to 928 to uh, 2.4 gigahertz and 5.7 gigahertz to 5.850. So I've, I've talked about the document revision process for the other bands within the uh, 5 gigahertz bands, though that would be the document revision process that I talked about, which we use the FCC um, uh, test reports. Uh, news on on IFT loss. Um, the new telecom PEC is being talked about. This one uh, has been in discussion for a long time now. The hope is to put together a, a PEC that would put together NOM 008, uh, 88, and 84, and other ones all in one, and uh, being able to update those older laws that go back to 2002. Uh, IFT 011. And cellular systems, this is in place. It, it regulates the bands that we have over here, 700 to all the way to 2500. Um, IFT 012 is directly with SARS, um, again, also already in place. And uh, um, actually, there is a, an update in August on IFT 012 that I will be able to detail a little bit more on the Q&A. Um, MRAs, this is something that was announced last year. Um, uh, NIST from the USA and Mexico were able to come up with a um, agreement if, uh, if the lab in um, Mexico had a lab in the United States that had an agreement, then their reports, their reports could be recognized. So these are MRAs that are actually being recognized by IFT. Um, to date, we only had about five labs that they were uh, on this scheme. Uh, Curtis Strauss, a UL, um, um, three UL uh, from different areas, uh, obviously here, and Michael Labs. Uh, the, the list keeps growing, so it's always good to check out um, what other labs are, are um, in the list of authorized MRAs. Um, one point to, to highlight over here is that um, the cost of doing the processing would be the same, it's just uh, the convenience of not sending a sample is uh, the, the key plus over here, okay? Uh, with that, we've, we've left Mexico and uh, we go to Central America, uh, the beautiful and warm countries of Central America. So. The process of uh, certifying products in Central America, obviously, is a little bit um, more uh, streamlined. No product testing in any of these countries. We can use the FCC certification. However, there is always variances in some of the bands. So it's always good to take a look at what is available in terms of uh, uh, RF um, uh, expansion in, in, in different areas. So. We're going to start with the list right at the top and uh, just mentioning who the uh, regulator is, is the Public Utility Commission. Uh, they've had a regulation dating back to 2012 that has not changed. Um, there are um, different uh, commissions as well that actually have the laws that they have to apply in terms of product approval. So SI 110 and 152 from 2012, both of them are up applied when we're looking at certifying products in uh, Belize. Uh, what products are there in their scope? Radio receivers, transmitters, transceivers, and any other accessories, satellite communications equipment, telecommunications equipment, and the local area grading devices. So just kind of a list of what we expect to, to have to go through the homologation process. Uh, 
here uh, there is the type approval. Most of the Caribbean does type approval. Uh, the list is no different. Um, uh, very close to the Caribbean, they do the type approval process, which is a, a less rigorous uh, revision than an homologation. An homologation process is a little bit more uh, detailed. Uh, type approval is a little bit uh, easier to 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 uh, review, and obviously time-wise uh, also reduced. So technical specifications, uh, country of origin, and a letter of authorization is required for this country, and four weeks in terms of uh, delivery. Um, Costa Rica, uh, a little bit more um, sophisticated, I would say, in terms of regulations. They certify uh, products by product. No modular certification is available. Uh, for the bands of 2.4, 90 hertz, which they call it free bands, no labeling is required. The validity is permanent. Uh, test reports are not required. Uh, FCC verification, yes, is required. And the lead time is about four weeks. For mobile devices, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, there's a lot of requirements in terms of how to go through the process on that. Uh, just um, as a summary, labeling is required, validity is permanent, there's got to be local testing, ICC verification definitely, and uh, lead time is anywhere between a month to a month and a half. Um, in terms of just other interesting things, uh, energy efficiency requirements, uh, there are for approval, and it applies mainly to refrigerators and freezers, okay? Uh, Subtel is the agency that oversees uh, all the delivery requirements that need to be complied by many manufacturers. The law is 8643, and uh, there's a recent update that we will talk about in the next slides. So uh, there's been a modification to the process, how we certify mobile products. They're be becoming a little bit more um, strict in terms of how they, um, they um, request not only who the distributors are, the, the documentation that your distributors are going to have to go through, registrations that, they're, they're, that they are um, actually requiring with the certifying body. Aside from that, um, apostle letters, uh, which are very hard to get sometimes from manufacturers if they have other partners. So this is something that uh, is, is just making the process a little slower than before. Um, so the, the, we have to request approval for the device operating in the free band. So there's got to be that, that process, which is the, the approval that we're asking. And also the verifications of the experts that are actually going to be maintaining that product in country. So that is also something new. In terms of requirements, technical specifications, pictures, uh, certificates, international certificates, whether it's CC, OCE, test reports, software, and Howard details, uh, the lead time uh, for this is also four weeks. Uh, in terms of samples that we talked about, uh, for cellular products, three samples, and uh, there's other requirements in terms of uh, the documentation that the local representative will have to uh, will have to present. With this, we move to El Salvador. Uh, Salvador. Um, a country that actually it's been a little bit of uh, turmoil for a little bit. Uh, now they're a little bit back to normal. Uh, we had um, a bit of delay in terms of getting certificates out of uh, Salvador, but things are getting back to normal. CIGET is the entity that oversees all the communications regulations. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, details, they only provide product approval. Label Labeling is not requ in a requirement. <coughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> the validity is permanent, and they, they do accept test reports, uh, FCC verification, and the lead time is uh, four weeks. Uh, just here, a view of one of the certificates and the kind of the documentation that we would need, <clears throat> and six weeks turnaround on this. <clears throat> I apologize. <clears throat> CIT is the Guatemala Telecommunications Agency and um, that oversees all the regulations. <coughs> it accepts FCC. <coughs> I apologize. <coughs> <coughs> I'm 
I'm just getting over a cold and it just helped me at the bad time. I apologize. Um, so the validity is permanent. Test reports, the verification for the FCC. And this is a short process, two, three, two to three weeks. Very important here to emphasize <coughs> that a certificate is not being issued, but it's a, an approval, uh, a dispensing approval. Let's move to Honduras. Uh, and Conatel is a regulatory agency. Um, we had some um, updates, as you can see, on uh, 2018. <coughs> and um, also a change in administration, which has had a big impact. Now they accept modular certification. Before it was only product certification, which um, it's beneficial to do many manufacturers. No labeling requirements. The validity is permanent, and test report from the FCC and validation is also required. Um, Honduras is a very a bureaucratic country. They have um, sometimes they 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 run very slow. There's several departments that you need to go through, so the lead time is long. So ten weeks, anywhere between eight to ten weeks, we're able to do an approval. <coughs> Here's just a sample of some of the uh, documents that we will need. Uh, something that is really uh, important here: the apostle letters. Again, very. Um, the new administration uh, are very legal uh, oriented, so any declaration for the manufacturer needs to be apostled, which can become uh, very cumbersome for, for many. Let's move to Nicaragua. Telcor is the agency um, that uh, obviously uh, oversees the delegation uh, requirements. Uh, the norm is to 200 from 1995. They haven't changed it in a long time. Uh, product certification, no labeling, validity is permanent. FCC obviously uh, uh, accepted and they do verify the FCC verification. And again, uh, Telcor takes a long time, very bureaucratic, 10 weeks. Here is just a, a view of one of the certificates and the kind of the documentation that we would need. Panama. Panama, the regulatory body is called ASEP, uh, that oversees the telecommunications regulations. Again, product approval, labeling not required, validity is permanent, test reports uh, accepted, FCC verification sometimes it's optional, and uh, lead time for weeks and no safety requirements in the country. So just a, a quick view of the requirements uh, in terms of documentation that we would need. Um, so there, uh, there is certification process for the cellular uh, for the cellular devices. So a different regulation and um, that has to go through the same document revision process, but there is a separate uh, rule that oversees cellular products. Um, there is different, different laws that apply to different things, so very um, key to review how we would regulate different items in terms of uh, your product. This allows us to move to the Caribbean. There's too many, too many islands to cover. Um, what I can say is that uh, the Caribbean prefers the, the, instead of the homologation process, which is more complicated, the type approval process. Uh, we've, we've selected the most important islands that you would be interested in, uh, but I think the highlight here is that as long as you have FCC, uh, as long as you have CE, uh, you're able to present information that they want in terms of their forms, uh, the certification process in the Caribbean is very, very straight through. Um, some countries do provide modular certification uh, and some other ones only product. So we've, we've uh, selected some of the most important ones here for you to view and uh, we can connect online if you have specific questions on some of these islands. So many islands to cover. 
uh, we're going to go to the ones that are most um, popular. So Dominican Republic is one. Um, the Indotel is the, the certifying body. They certify only by product and no labeling requirements. The validity is permanent. Test reports again, verification for FCC uh, is needed. So that means uh, if, you, if they can't verify that your product is uh, certifying the FCC, then they, they, they will deny your, your uh, request. Uh, so the lead time is about six weeks for Indotel. Um, again, uh, mentioning some of the norms that are applicable for, for, the, for Indotel and um, just the uh, some of the, the documents that will be needed, technical specifications, fixtures, user manual, and test reports. So a short list of documents for that. Puerto Rico, um, if you have FCC, uh, you're definitely good to be able to go through to Puerto Rico. Uh, for safety requirements, they will accept IUL. Sometimes there is products that um, they do not have FCC. You can actually have a lab in uh, Puerto Rico to do your testing if you want. But anything that does uh, that cannot comply, then they send it to the United States to get it to get it tested. But I thought that was an interesting thing that you know they do. Even though they do have uh, FCC uh, clearance, um, they do still have uh, ability to test in in Puerto Rico. That I thought for some of you would be interesting. So uh, in, in terms of safety. Uh, as long as you have a UL certification or safety uh, um, certification, uh, it's valid over there too. The last island, which is very popular, Jamaica. Uh, Jamaica, uh, we, we have the SMA or the Spectrum Management Authority as one of the uh, regulatory bodies. Uh, they do actually do product and module certification. Labeling is uh, required. Uh, and validity is permanent. They do use the test reports and they do verify uh, that the product is certified with the FCC. Um, just um, here to give you an idea of the types of uh, approvals that they would have uh, in terms of what they manage. So um, they, they broadcasting, radio equipment, uh, radio telephony, and uh, also radio technician certificates. So there's different types of, of um, a spectrum that they, they oversee, and just here a, a sample of the grants that you would get with uh, Jamaica. Um, the approval process here um, is, um, you know, pretty straightforward. They do give you an approval number that you will have to, uh, you don't have that you have to display to make sure that the type approval is uh, actually um, homologated, especially for the module and also for the product. Okay. So uh, this concludes our presentation. We've gone uh, a little bit over uh, half an hour, I think. We are open to any uh, questions that you may have. I just want to say thank you, Elizabeth. That was a wonderful, knowledgeable uh, webinar you gave. I do see a couple of questions here. I don't know if you see them in the chat. If you don't, I can read them for you. Yeah, if you don't mind reading them, I don't see them. Sure, I'll read it. So the first one was, what does FCC or CE test report verification mean? Okay, so um, when uh, you present your test report um, or your certificate, they want to, the, the regulatory body actually goes to the FCC and wants to match the information that you have presented to them. If you don't have FCC, or maybe sometimes what happens is some products are delayed. The posting of their of their uh, test reports, perhaps it's a special project that they don't want to make it public for a while. Uh, if they cannot verify that that's posted, they will not grant you the the permit. So. Uh, the countries that I mentioned for FCC verification, they will not issue you the certificate unless they see it and verify that it's also public in the FCC uh, site. I hope that answers your question. I believe it did. The second part of that question was, what will be the verification procedure? What does that look like? Um, I just mentioned to you they would um, they would go through every single a folder that is public in the FCC and make sure that the models match, make sure that the photos match, 
make sure that uh, all the documentation that we provided them is completely matches. If they see any variance, obviously they will question you. All right, and then there's another question that just came in um, for Costa Rica. What is the operating frequency for RF products? Uh, 912 to 919 megahertz or 433 megahertz? Hmm. I would have to, um, right now, we have 900, there's 400 as well, but I think I this is something that perhaps if he can send me an email, I would hate to give him a, a range that I don't have a right in front of me. But there's uh, there's different ranges, for especially for the 900 band in Latin America, there's different ranges that different countries use. And I don't have it right in front of me, so but I can definitely uh, respond to his email if he can just email me at the email of his, uh, that I'm showing on the screen. And I'll be able to provide to him a, the exact uh, um, answer that he's looking for. All right, that's all the questions I see. Is there any other questions? Give it a minute or two. Okay. Nothing on Mexico. I'm surprised. I guess I explained very well. <laughs> <laughs> you did. I'm actually learning about that. So you'll probably get a couple from me. Okay, no problem. <laughs> There is one that just popped in, and the question is, are there energy efficiency requirements for battery chargers in Mexico? Is there a label needed? Hmm. Battery chargers, uh, depending what type, energy efficiency requirements are usually for power supplies right now. And also there's all kinds of different uh, energy efficiency uh, laws uh, for different types of products. One is for audio. Uh, which is NOM 032, NOM 029 is for power supplies. So depending, uh, a battery charger to me, if it's just a primary battery charger or, or is it a lithium, uh, depending on what type of battery we're talking about, uh, I, I doubt there would be. I don't think it would be on the scope because most of the ones that uh, we know, and Israel, who is our engineer um, expert in Mexico, also in the call here, he can verify. Uh, I believe uh, most of the other energy efficiency requirements, Israel, is uh, not for anything to do with batteries, correct? Uh, yes, Mr. Uh, basically, if the battery charger uh, comes with an AC-DC adapter and um, <clears throat> this is this will be like uh, in the scope of NOM uh, 29. Now there may be other products like uh, with uh, which comes with an internal AC DC uh, transformer. In that case, that will be the scope of the NOM uh, 32. But it depends on the product. It depends uh, of, uh, of the characteristics of the product. Yeah, we would have to review the data sheet. And again, uh, um, your, uh, your your guest is welcome to send us a, a an email and share um, the specifications, and we'll be very happy to provide them the guidance. All right, I have another one or more, two more questions uh, for certification process in Carousel and St. Lucia. Is it allowed to use FCC test reports, and is it allowed by this country's FCC power levels? Yes, definitely. Uh, in Curacao, you have to have a product certification, and Santa Lucia, you're, per, you're, you're flexible. You, you can have modular or, or, or product. All right, then I have another question. These are chargers to charge radios or batteries for, ready, for radios? L I and N I M H. If I'm reading that correctly. So oh, lithium and nickel. Lithium ion. Mm. lithium ion batteries. So he's asking whether uh, there's regulation for lithium lithium batteries. Yes. Oh, I, I let, let let me make him happy. There is no currently there's no lithium battery regulations in Latin America. Not at the moment. Argentina gave us a huge scare uh, um, at the beginning of the year this year, uh, but they retracted. But thus far, nothing for lithium. There is requirements for primary batteries in Argentina, in Colombia, in Mexico. Uh, Mexico actually in September just uh, put the 212 uh, in, in place, which is uh, 
you know, um, in country testing for primary batteries. So that is a big change. Okay, thank you for that. Um, not seeing any more questions coming in at the moment. Okay. Um, I guess we can almost wrap this up. If you still have questions later you can think of, or if I just happen to overlook your questions, please feel free to send your questions to the email you see on the screen, which is Elizabeth Perry's email. I will also like if you can maybe CC us here at Washington Laboratory so, one, I can learn some of the things that are being shared. And that email I showed you earlier was questions with an S at W L L like Larry Larry dot com. Again, if you can also CC us along with those questions at questions at WLL dot com. Our thanks go to Elizabeth Pierre for taking time out to enlighten us about the compliance process in Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. Please join us next month when we will continue the South of the Border Compliance discussion with an overview of product compliance with countries in South America. On behalf of Washington Laboratories Academy, I would like to thank you all for attending. And at this point, I will go ahead and now end the event and stop the recording. Please enjoy the rest of your day. And again, Elizabeth and Israel, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. All right, you do the same. Bye-bye.